I'm your host, Sharada Devi, of the Born to be Free podcast that serves as a bridge between the ancient and the new era, a confluence of opposites where all is seen as sacred and every experience is meant to catapult you into your supreme destiny. Om Shanti 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 So, welcome. I'm Sharada, (laughs) host of the podcast called Born to be Free. And I feel so blessed and privileged to be here today with a very, very dear and very special, very beautiful, very wise, gorgeous woman. Her name is Kaya Minlin. I'm so happy you're here today with me. Thank you so much for being here for this podcast. And I would like to just say a few words. I have so many words to say (laughs) because she's just this incredible woman. We actually haven't met in person, but I know we've met many, many times in other lives. And we have a very special, sacred bond through the sharing of our lineage. We come from the same lineage. Uh, from Swami Dayananda, Sri Pujya Swami Dayananda Saraswati. And we've met online, actually. <laughs> so thanks, Goddess, to Saraswati in the form of online <laughs> connections. <laughs> so Kaya Mindli, she is a mother, incredible mother. I admire her so much, of two beautiful boys. And she's a wife of a beautiful, incredible, beautiful um, man, astrologer, Michael who I can recommend highly and who I also will invite for the podcast, Born to be Free. (laughs) So Kaya Devi is a teacher behind the teacher. She's the guide behind many of today's teachers of yoga, Ayurveda, astrology and yoga nidra. Long-time practitioners seek her for mature practice, meaningful philosophy and authentic pedagogy, pedagogy that reflects her 20 years of teaching, the mystical and practical, full spectrum of yoga. She's a lineage holder and a steward of the yoga tradition with 3,000 hours of formal study with her own gurus in the Veda tradition. Yoga, yoga's intrinsic purpose shines through every aspect of Kaya's programs. Teachings generously and spontaneously pour out of Kaya and I know because your newsletter is incredible. I've got to sign up for mm. Kaya's newsletter because it's just the wealth of knowledge. I love them and everything you share. And yeah, I'm going to go there. With storytelling at the heart, she masterfully threads therapeutic yoga, mysticism, Vedic astrology, Ayurveda, Vedanta, Tantra, scripture and mantra. Her warm, nurturing and layered approach resonates with students all over the world who seek deepen their lives in every way. Programs with Kaya are intricately, 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 my mother tongue is not English, intricately organized for depth and meaning. Yet she remains responsive to individual needs of her students moment to moment. So thank you so much, Kaya Devi, for being here with me today. And I so look forward to our conversation (laughs) how are you i'm well it's such a pleasure to be with you always always yes i'm happy to be with you here (laughs) Mm -hmm. yes so um, special moment i just launched a born to be free podcast and i felt you're gonna i wanted to invite you i knew from the beginning i want to invite you as I always, since the very beginning, how I don't remember exactly how we met, if it was through someone or, but somehow we met through this online world and I, and we connected and we knew that we come from the both the same lineage, from Swami Dayananda. And uh, coming from Swamiji's lineage, Swami Dayananda is a Renaissance Vedanta teacher. We also like to call, 
his it's very difficult to put in words what he means to us uh, the ones that have studied with him in person directly he's not with us in body and flesh anymore as he took Mahasamadhi in 2015 and Kaya Devi and Michael her husband and myself we both had the privilege and blessing to study with Swami Dayananda um, before he took Mahasamadhi what is Mahasamadhi? Mahasamadhi is when uh, a jnani, a wise person, does not take a new life anymore. Mm -hmm. So the whole teaching basically of what we have studied, Kaya Devi and myself, Vedanta, and the whole Vedic tradition, the sole purpose of a jiva, of an individual that is incarnated, is basically to discover moksha, mm -hmm. to discover freedom from the cycle of birth and death. And so a wise person or a yogi or a mumukshu, one that seeks freedom, basically the freedom that an, a seeker seeks is the freedom from that cycle of birth and death. And so as a jnani, as a wise person, that means that a wise person knows what its essential nature is. It knows that it is limitless. Its nature is free from birth and death. So I could go on and on and speak so much about that, but just to give a little bit of background of what Samadhi, Maha Samadhi is, and, and Swami Dayananda has dedicated his whole life, 40 plus years, to the Veda, to the Vedanta tradition, to the Vedanta Pramanam, uh, independent means of knowledge in the form of words to reveal the vision of oneness. The vision of oneness means that you and I are one and the same being. There is only one self, one non-dual self, and that is the heart of Vedanta. And Swami Dayananda is a lineage holder and a sampradaya wit, one that knows how to unfold these teachings in a way that uh, is methodog methodologically and systematically so that anyone who has a sincere desire to gain freedom, freedom from the cycle of birth and death, can gain moksha, can gain freedom. And so... That's a little bit of the background of Swami Dayananda and, and Kaya Devi has been with him. So maybe would you just, maybe we begin with that, like to share a little bit about your experience with Swamiji. And Some Swamiji sharing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. You know, Swamiji kept popping in to mine and my husband Michael's lives because we had had teachers, some primary teachers who were also students of Swamiji. And so his name would keep coming up, keep coming up. <laughs> this person is a student of Swamiji, this person. And in particular, um, our Jyotisha teacher, <clears throat> whose name is Hart, one of his primary gurus was Puja Swami Dayananda. And so he was always speaking of him. And so we started doing some like, you know, audio classes, you know, all those audio recordings that there are of Puja Swami Dayananda teaching so many different shastras, so many scriptures, so many oral teachings, so many talks, <clears throat> and reading his books. And then finally, in fact, Michael and I went through a very difficult um, experience with one of our teachers. And so immediately we went to Swami Dayananda's place in the U.S., which is in Pennsylvania. And we went there, what we thought was going to be two weeks of study with Puja Swami Dayananda and another one of the Swamiji's. And this was in 2010, something like this. Anyway, Swamiji kept staying and he kept staying and he kept staying and he kept staying. He was supposed to go back to India, but he kept staying. And because that wasn't the plan, nobody knew that Swamiji was there. There was no plan that he was supposed to be there after those two weeks. Then the number of people that were there at the ashram got smaller and smaller and smaller because no one knew he was there. So it was this very special, sacred, intimate um, time we did not spend many years with him as in India as many have done and as you did but we spent these very intimate unexpected several months with Swamiji in his U.S. ashram we didn't realize we had also spent time 
around the ashram in Rishikesh years ago. We kept dancing around it and being there. And we studied Jyotisha with a teacher who lived like right next door to the ashram. So, you know, this is how karma is. It keeps circling and circling until you finally get the message and <laughs> the timing is ripe. And then you, you know, find what you're meant to find. So in that time, we were studying Bhagavad Gita and the and other shasta, other scripture with Swamiji. And then we also got to sit with him a number of times in small group, um, and this, the two of us. And near the very, very end of his time, we went to Swamiji with our horoscopes. So Shada the Devi knows that Swamiji was not just an, he was not an academic, although he was enti entirely scholarly in so many ways, but he was an artist. He was a dance. He was he was a musician. He loved to watch dance, and he was a great Jyotishi. He knew Jyotish so well. So we brought our horoscopes to him, and he silently looked them over for some time, and then um, he looked, you know, very very seriously at us, and he said, "Okay, you open an institute." You do Ayurveda, you do Jyotisha, you teach yoga therapy, you teach Vedanta, and it must be an institute, and go. And um, that was the last time we saw him. Yeah. That was our last time with him privately. And then soon after that, um, you know, he had to go. He got to, he got to go back to his motherland, back to India. I think that was the last time he came to the U.S., and then we didn't get to India to see him before because <laughs> some other very magical things happened when we were staying there at the ashram. And so right after that time, um, we started having babies. <laughs> and also that institute fell into our lap because someone called me and said, I don't want to have my yoga studio anymore. Do you want it? And so we took this on and instead of it being a yoga studio, it became this institute, which of course now is actually very virtual, very real, but very virtual, but because in, in many ways, because of the blessing of Puja Swami Dayananda. So um, that's a little bit of our time with him. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. How wonderful. And it's so special that, that you and Michael, that I mentioned before, Kaya's husband, who is this incredible Vedic astrologer, I've had a couple of sessions with him, and they were spot on. <laughs> <laughs> and he 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 does the astrology reading in such in such profound and graceful ways. It's very delicate, like Vedic astrology or any kind of astrology, a horoscope. Really, maybe you want to share just a little bit, like for people that don't know exactly what it is here for and yeah the delicacy of it really mm -hmm. and maybe also a little bit about the difference between vedic astrology and and western astrology mm -hmm. yes yeah, so vedic astrology really is one of the names that we use to talk about sort of part of what is called jyotisha which is considered the it's called the eye of the vedas so jyotisha is astronomy and astrology of the Vedic tradition. And you're really meant to look at these cosmic conditions before you do anything, before you choose your asana practice, your pranayama practice, before you know what ritual you're meant to do, which uh, form of the divine you're meant to practice devotion to, what your path is in life as an individual, uh, what we might expect of the day, of the year, and so on and how to even understand scripture, we're supposed to look through this eye that is astronomy and astrology or jyotisha. And one of the aspects of jyotisha is looking at an individual's karma, the map of their karma, by looking at the sky at the time of their birth, which we would call horoscope or birth horoscope. There are other things that are looked at with Jyotisha, like the palm, the condition of the hand, and the lines on the hand, and the condition of the body, all reading these maps of karma and dharma. Um, and we look at the astrology of the moment. For example, I, I told Shada the Devi, as before we sat down, I looked, what is the Jyotisha of the time that we're going to have this conversation? It sheds light on what is, what is this time about? What is this divine time? Uh, how can we use it? And it, the way that I sort of 
talk about the two primary applications of Vedic astrology in our individual lives is one, understanding, understanding why things happened the way they, they happened or that things were meant to happen the way that they happen, understanding ourselves, understanding our circumstance, understanding the, the, the blessings and boons as well as the curses and challenges of our lives and learning how to navigate those and um, accept them as well. So gaining that insight and understanding about ourselves and our lives on the one hand, and then on the other hand, gaining some strategy. How do we move through based on what those conditions are? How do we apply our will? So many people think we either have complete free will, we get to decide everything, (laughs) me, me, me. And other people think everything is entirely up to fate or destiny. And the Vedic vision as Sharata Devi well knows, is that it's both. We have destiny patterns. We have certain things that are bound. But we also have free will, which is divine. Both are divine. The patterns that are unchangeable are divine, and our free will, which can navigate and make choice and and so on, uh, is also divine. So Jyotisha helps us with understanding the circumstances and applying our free will with strategy, with right timing, Um, to move through life in the way that we will extract the best from the life that we're here to live. So people come to Jyotisha with so many questions about themselves, their lives, the people in their lives, and also questions about decision-making. Should I get married? And then when? Should I have babies? And when? Should I study something? And when? Should I move to a new land? And when? Or should I not do these things? what's in the cards and how can I, you know, do this with grace at the right time. So, and it's very complicated. So delicate is the right word because it's delicate because you're dealing with the intimacies of people's lives and, and delicate because it's multi-layered. It's, it's, it's very fine mathematics. You're really looking at the astronomy uh, when we first studied Jyotisha together, we were just sitting on the Ganga doing math for hours and hours and hours and hours calculating these fine calculations, which is all a form of devotion to Ganapati, who's sitting here also, who's the lord of Jyotisha. So really, we would say without Jyotisha, you can't do Ayurveda, you can't do yoga, and with Jyotisha, you can do all of these things and live a very good life. But it requires someone who has the delicacy to understand this very complicated system and the delicacy and the practicality to be able to work with people, you know, to be with humanity and to be sensitive to the human experience. So, yeah, this is what it is. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah, and Michael really has, and you as well, and my sessions I've had was with Michael, that delicacy to convey what is there in the stars, because what is said, it really can, it has... If the heart is open, it can have such a profound impact in one's mind and it can really play with one's thoughts. And so to have a trustworthy Jyotisha is indispensable. <laughs> it's priceless, <laughs> really. Mm. So talking about karma and free will, what I wanted to point out what I feel is fascinating is that you and Michael know each other for so many years and that for sure is (laughs) karma (laughs) and then we can talk about free will what the karma of meeting your husband (laughs) how long have you been married we have been a couple for I think 23 years this year and we got married 10 years into, so 13 years married and 23 years as though married, because after three months of meeting, we were living together and as though married. So 23 years. Yeah. 23 yeah. years. This is karma to meet. Like, so we would say, this is karma. if you meet at that age and you stay and you study Jyotisha and you meet Swami Dayananda and then you have babies, two beautiful boys that are mm-hmm. incredible. I'm just in awe when I see your reels and your chanting with them and they are chanting and they have the proper pronunciation of Sanskrit or Samskritam and yeah just tell a little bit about that it's so beautiful to like hear is, uh, the background story <laughs> and, and and to see that you and I 
We're just people like any other people, and yet we all have our unique story and our karma that we come into this life with. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's such a, there's certain things that are these, it's called dridda karma. It's un, it's fixed. It's unchangeable karma. No matter, even if you try to avoid it, it will keep coming back. And some of us have certain parts of life that are very fixed. There's no avoiding it. And other parts of life that are very open and you can kind of choose this or that. And there's blessing in both. So when it comes to our relationship, it's probably very close to fixed karma. In fact, we were studying um, Hasta Samudraka, which is a palmistry study with our Jyotisha teacher. And he looked, <clears throat> excuse me, he looked at my hand and he said, okay, well, when you were 23, you definitely uh, had a complete change in the course of your life and you met the person that you're going to be with for the rest of your life. 23, 22, something like whenever it was. And he had nailed it just from looking at my palm. There it is, you know. And when you look at mine and my, Michael's horoscopes, they're like yin yang. You know, they're exactly flipped like this. And when we met, it's very much like Puja Swami Dayananda. And I think many people can relate to something in their lives where you keep circling around something that's meant to be. And so when... Um, when I met Michael, I had been I had moved across the country from the east coast of the US to the west coast, and I was living in this town for many months and had not met anyone that really felt like a heart connection, just even friendships. And I made a vow. I told the universe, you know, I was like, if I don't meet these heart people, sisterhood, brotherhood people in the next six months, then I'll go. And so within that six months, I met Michael and we, we saw each other. We didn't speak. We were too shy. And then two days later, <laughs> we were waiting. No one was saying anything. Then two days later, we saw each other in the same place again. And I had said to my roommate, I said, if I see him again, then I'll say something. And so I gave the universe another opportunity. I, I'll, I'll take. I'll listen this time. So then, two days later, we saw each other again in the same place, and then we we started speaking, and and then I said, as we were saying goodbye, I said, um, "I'm going to give you my phone number," and he said, um, "Well, what are you going to do tonight?" In the time, I thought, wow, he really likes me because he wants to even know what I'm doing right now, you know, tonight. He doesn't even want my phone number. Just what are you doing tonight? But then later I found out he had no money. He had no telephone number. <laughs> <laughs> so he couldn't call me. <laughs> so I said, um, well, I'm actually going to my friend's drum recital tonight. And he said, ah, but I'm going to my friend's drum recital tonight. So that was interesting. We would have met that night in the same very small drum recital. And so he said, well, why don't you pick me up? Because also he didn't have a car. I didn't have a car either. So I borrowed a car and I thought, oh, we're going on a date. Me and this beautiful man that I met at the health food store. And so I went to pick him up for the date and five guys got in the car. <laughs> five hippies got in the car. <laughs> five meditating hippies, yogi hippie guys. So I always joke that I went home and told my roommate, I have a date. And he went home and told all of his friends, we have a ride. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> this is the masculine, masculine feminine. <laughs> right there, 101. Not to generalize, of course, in any way. But. <laughs> but also, it was so interesting because I had told the universe, I had said to the divine, if you don't give me some friends in six months, I'm leaving. And so all these friends piled into the car. And we very immediately became very close. We weren't a couple right away, but we came. We became very close right away. And then within three months, we were a couple and we were living together and life started changing very quickly. We went to India together right away. And But there was yet another time when we were on a walk and 
We found out that we both almost lived in the same house at the same time. He was going to rent a room from a friend, and I was going to rent this room in the bottom of this big house. So we realized there was another time. If we hadn't met those other times, we would have met there. It just wow. was It was one of those things that was clearly unavoidable, and a lot of magic magical things happened around the time when we were meeting new beginnings and so on that showed that this was a definite kind of moment in time that was a big shift in both of our lives. And I think um, any of us, when we have those kinds of experiences, hopefully it becomes something that we remember as, okay, when these things happen, remember to listen and pay attention when there's sort of a repetition of a theme, a call, it's a call to attention that this is a clear message of a pathway um, in a particular direction that's designed for you. So, yeah. Wow. Incredible. Incredible. Mm. Mm. That is karma when things fall into place, when yes. you meet the people. Like, out of thousands, millions, billions of people, you meet that person and not that person. Yeah. And and that is the result when we talk about karma, like what is karma? Karma is the result of the accumulated action that we have um, engaged in, in this life or in a past life. Mm -hmm. So just to give a little yeah. bit of background, because like the word like karma and dharma, they are used in the spiritual world now in all traditions. Mm -hmm. The shamanic traditions talks about karma and the Celtic and the Egyptian and all use these words, but it really comes from the Vedic tradition and it's important to understand that the, the karmic model, how we all as a jiva, that individual that has identified with the body-mind-sense complex and has taken countless lives, has, has a sanchitta karma that is like this infinite karma where all the result of all the accumulated karma over all the countless lives in the form of painful and pleasurable experiences are there in this sanchitta karma. And then at the time of your birth, we call that the prarabdha karma, the karma that has very well began and goes all the way to the time of your death. And that time, that karma is called prarabdha karma. So that is the karma that we are exhausting now, you and I and we, that we and that Kaya and I and you who is listening here with us, that is karma, that we are here together. There are so <laughs> many unseen factors involved that we get to be here and we're exhausting right now our karma. And not only that, we're also right now creating new karma in this moment. Mm -hmm. And that is what we call agami karma. So right now in this moment, we're creating new karma. And, and Kai and I, we've both used our free will <laughs> also to be here, right? <laughs> so the free will, what Kaya Devi talked about, that we do get to choose. So we do have this life that unfolds and we get to exhaust that karma in the form of painful and pleasurable experiences and we all really want what kind of experiences pleasurable i would say pleasure. right <laughs> <laughs> we all want pleasure and we all want happy in other words we all want freedom right? that's why this podcast is yeah. called born to be free like to discover that we want freedom, and freedom is actually not to be found out there. So where do I find it? Inside? Not outside, not inside. It is you. So how have you, like when we talk about free will, can you remember the moment when you chose, when you desired freedom? And, and what was your understanding of freedom until... It was clear what freedom was because like if we ask people what is freedom we will get a million different answers and for us yeah. freedom is very clearly defined yes do you remember the moment when you desire yes. freedom and you chose well, freedom as self-knowledge you know maybe you have this similar i've listened to you share some really beautiful and inspiring and also heart-wrenching parts of your own story. And um, I think when there's this strong momentum of karma, that, you know, Shada Devi was just talking about this momentum of karma from the past that kind of thrusts us into what's fruiting in this present life. Um, and some people have a strong momentum of karma due to 
actions due to the free will choices that we made in the past that mean you're born into being a life of a seeker, a seeker of freedom, a seeker of moksha. We all want freedom in some form, right? We all want to feel we have free will. We all want to feel we have space. We all want to feel we have choice. We all want some form of freedom. But of course, Sharada Devi and I are also seekers of that ultimate, supreme moksha freedom, that full freedom. And I think when there's a lo- when there's a strong karmic momentum, there are signs of that that very early in life, right? So from very, very early, maybe two, three years old, I have memories of asking the question internally. I didn't ever say it out loud, um, but asking the question, is it possible to be happy all the time? And why aren't we happy all the time? And then when I was about 10 years old, um, well, not about, when I was 10 years old, my father died suddenly. And so this was this kind of first, very primal experience of suffering early in life. So along with this quest, yes, we share this exactly. And um, I think, you know, that's also karma. I found that I've been, you know, magnetized to people with some version of that kind of story, the loss of of a parent and the loss of a father in particular, which leaves a mark in your life. Um, And so when that happened, I also started also asking the question, why do we suffer? Why do we have pain? And so these two questions stayed with me and, and it led me to look for answers in politics, in structures of society. You know, as I grew older and started studying things, I got very interested in understanding. Um, I read a lot of books, for example, about the experience of slavery in the United States, which was asking this question internally about freedom versus suffering. And I read a lot of books about Egypt and that culture. And ultimately, I started studying um sociology because I thought maybe I would find the answers to why we suffer and is happiness possible in the form of social structures. But that was limited. I didn't find it there. And so then I found the Vedic tradition. I found, I ended up with a teacher when I was about 19 years old who was teaching uh, Vedic scripture and he taught me how to meditate and it was in meditation that I experienced complete expansiveness. I had had some taste of that when I was a teenager, but it wasn't intentional. It was sort of accidental <laughs> moments of this, everything is gone and I'm groundless and I'm completely expansive, but I didn't ever know where it came from and I didn't have a system of knowledge or practice. So by then, when I was 19 years old, when I found that teacher and started practicing meditation and had those in, inner experiences of expansiveness, then that was it. Then it was clear to me, this is the freedom that I was seeking. And there wasn't really any turning back. I don't know that it was, you know, an omen or anything like that, but it was definitely the sort of signposts again. And I think then meeting that teacher was was a point when there was no turning back. Everything else that I thought had the answers was far less compelling. And there was never again anything more compelling, you know, than than that form of freedom and the systems of knowledge that that lead you there. So then it was just like insatiable hunger. <laughs> Oh, on a fire. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The hair is on fire. (laughs) Yeah, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Teacher. The key is teacher. Like two things I'd like to, to, to talk is one is the teacher and then one knowledge. Because in the spiritual world, we have, a definition of freedom, uh, different definitions. For us, uh, Vedantins, if we can say so, there's very clear that freedom is through the removal of self-ignorance, 
through discovering what my essential nature is here and now. In other words, self-knowledge. And then when you hear the word knowledge, it's like, oh, for many people, they, we, we get triggered, we, 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 we freeze, yeah. we want to run away because authority issues, abuse mm. of mist or the trust that we lost. And we lost the trust in, in, in studying, in, in teachers, basically, in a means of knowledge other than science. And so maybe we can just say a few words about, because we could go into any topic and talk for hours and hours and hours. And, and there's also something that we really want to specifically talk about, which is to come from a tradition and to hold a tradition and to also be a teacher. You are an incredible teacher and we both play the role of a teacher and how that uh, is in life. But before we go into that, just like, yeah, let's t talk a little bit about like you meeting that teacher and understanding, like to have that knowledge that, that then you desired to have, which is different from becoming one's own guru and, and seeking an experience to gain mm. freedom. I have been quite lucky that I've had very, very amazing teachers in my life, including, you know, just amazing teachers in childhood, teachers of music and dance and teachers of in school. I have had, I had some terrible teachers, of course, we all have, but I have had some amazing teachers. And I was contemplating this today about people's expectations for the perfect teacher. And I think it's been a blessing in my life that for some reason, I never had an expectation that a teacher be perfect. Um, I was always able to just extract whatever was beneficial from a teacher and accept that a teacher is may have a lot of value to share, but also may be imperfect. And I have definitely had some very imperfect teachers. I also have, you know, an imperfect mother. And I think from a very young age, I... I don't think I was I don't think I was even born with the expectation that my mother be perfect. And I think that's a lot of what trips people up is they, you know, as little children, most of us want mommy and daddy, mama and papa to be perfect. And we get very disappointed when we discover that they're not. And then we look for a teacher that's supposed to be perfect because we haven't healed that that wound of the disappointment because of that expectation. And I, I think for some reason, I was not born with that expectation that the parent be perfect or that the teacher be perfect. And I think that was a blessing because it allowed me to study with imperfect teachers. <laughs> and it's allowed me to be imperfect and it's allowed me to do imperfect action and not get a complex, as Swamiji would say, not get a complex about it. Um, and so I've been lucky to have amazing teachers and also imperfect teachers and allow them to be imperfect mm -hmm. um, and actually be, uh, I kind of appreciate sometimes an imperfect teacher, a teacher that's not trying to charm me uh, into believing that they're perfect. So even Puja Swami Dayananda and my other primary guru who are both, uh, you know, enlightened beings, we can say, we're not perfect humans, you know? But I was never really interested in fault finding with a teacher. And to me, the teacher was always the means to that freedom. And thankfully I had teachers that were able to deliver that. So, um, you know, when we talk about knowledge, Sharada and I, we both know we don't mean information. We mean luminosity. We mean understanding something in a way that makes other things be known. So, um, yeah, I think that's the role that some of my most important teachers and gurus have played is that they transmitted luminosity. They, they enlivened and shined a light on that knowledge that shines a light on me and my purpose and the world and other people. And that's, 
I think the role of the teacher is that that capacity. And I know, yes, you have had amazing teachers and you have also had imperfect teachers, I think, but have gained so much. And I think you are also very good at being very vulnerable with your students and letting them see. I'm sure that's been a journey. It probably wasn't always that way. Maybe you want to talk about that. But showing, you know, your vulnerability and your journey and being very raw and open about that, I think is very um, inspiring because it allows other, it allows your students to shed their hangups about being perfect. Um, that you can be an incredible teacher or you can be an incredible whatever it is you're meant to be because of course we ha have students who are not teachers and are not meant to be teachers they just love this knowledge and they love moksha and they love devotion and and i think being a you're a very good model of someone that shows your vulnerabilities and the rawness of your pilgrimage in life and the lessons and i think it helps people shed the wrong idea that they have to be perfect in order to do what they're here to do. You're clearly doing what you're here to do. And you're also clearly showing that you can do that in a very vulnerable way. I think you show beautifully that it's possible to be in process and be doing your dharma, which is very alive. It's very, it's very alive. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that brings us to to sharing like what has blessed us so profoundly and being real, <laughs> completely utterly real with our own process and and that has been a a process for me because I've had the most incredible teachers. <laughs> I was a little bit more the person that I just saw them as perfect. Like it, it was something yeah. there. I, I just always saw them as perfect. I never, never say never, but I didn't look for faults. And I did see the, the jewel that was there and that has blessed me profoundly. In Swami Vagishananda and Sri Radhaji, these are senior, senior disciples, senior students of Swami Dayananda. Same with Swami Dayananda and other teachers, um, Amaji and Paramartanandaji and Tatvavidanandaji. And just, but my mo main has been Vagishananda and Radhaji. And, and, and it has been a process to, to, f to, to actually be me and me in terms of the relative person, personality. So we, we are talking about often that when we come to the teachings, there is a meltdown that takes place. So the, the ahankara, the, the wrong eye notion, we don't like so much to call it the ego because often the ego can have a little bit of derogatory connotation. And so just seeing that wrong eye notion, ahankara, that, that, that wrong eye notion that, that we all have about ourselves because of self-ignorance, because we don't know what we really are, and nor our mother and our father, nobody really knew what they really are. We make judgments based on a wrong conclusion about the self, the self being limited, which is not true. And so when we come to this teaching and discover with the help of a mirror in the form of words that is unfolded by a teacher, that also had a teacher, and also had a teacher, and also had a teacher, to see their essential nature as limitless, we melt. <laughs> like the, the, that ahankara, it just, when there is trust, shraddha and bhakti devotion, poof, there's a meltdown. Like, and, and for me, that meltdown has taken place, especially when I got divorced. <laughs> because I wanted to not get divorced. Like my story is not like Kaya, where I've been married for 23 years and <laughs> my karma was very clear to get married and to get divorced there was no way to to uh, to change that karma i tried very hard i tried everything to avoid it uh, that's a whole other story it had to happen and it was which seemed to be the curse at the time turned out to be the greatest blessing because i had to die that relative 
wrong eye notion had to die. And, and there was a, a, a reminting, like the meltdown and the reminting of that coin the, the, from a place of where we establish a healthy ego with a healthy self-esteem yeah. and a healthy self-image, which is crucial to gain freedom. We cannot bypass the heart and we cannot bypass the past and we cannot bypass our pain, we cannot bypass our trauma and, and think we can gain absolute freedom. So that journey is very, very crucial and important. That's really the sadhana, that's what the yoga and the jyotish and the ayurveda is here to help us become that mature person in order to gain knowledge. And so in that reminting, I love to just take now the, this time to yeah, share. And, and like for me, that has been a huge journey to really come from a traditional teaching, Vedic tradition, that I've seen how my teachers have embodied these teachings. And my teachers have been sannyasis. They have taken sannyasa, which means, except Radha, but she still has lived a very renounced life. They never got married. They didn't have children my teachers, and nor Kaya Devi's teacher. So our example has been renunciates. They have chosen not to get married, not to have children, not to be really engaged in social engagements. Radhaji, yes, she, she, she was is a Jungian analyst, psychologist, and had a job, a beautiful contribution to this world teaching Vedanta in the university in Berkeley which is very rare and unique and also was a, a therapist at the same time she lived a very uh, simple life of a sadhu of a, of a person that is just with God and with the scriptures and dedicated to gaining freedom and, and Swamiji Magishananda he he's dedicated his whole life also to the Vedantic teachings and and so many of our role models have lived a sannyasa life, a life of a renunciate. And then me, I, I chose not to be a renunciate. I mean I am in my in my heart that's a process, ongoing process. <laughs> that internal sannyasa, that internal internal tyaga buddhi we call it, that attitude of letting go without feeling really a loss because there's nothing that we can lose, really, because we are everything. Yet at the same time, I chose to like be in this world and play a role of a teacher and also diving into other topics, especially sacred sexuality, which I've included now a lot in this Vedic tradition, which has been a big process for me to bring that in uh, into our tradition. And how has it been for you like to, to be a, a steward holder of a tradition and being a woman and yeah, coming also from men teachers that have been renunciates. Yeah, so <clears throat> this is what this is something Sharada Devi and I have in common this responsibility of stewardship and teaching many people um, from a tradition. And having models of teachers that live very renunciate lives, uh, very simple lives, solitary lives, full time, almost dedicated to, yeah, the divine and the scripture and the systems of knowledge, and not a lot of worldly responsibilities or relational responsibilities, and certainly not a lot of of a sexual bhava. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so. And but I think for myself, there and I know from my horoscope, there is a side to me that, and it may be the same for you. There's a side to me that was very attracted to renunciation. When I met my husband, I had one room with no bed, just a blanket on the floor, one pillow, and a stack of library books. That was all I had. One a oh, one light so I could read. You know, and he was the same. He had one room. He didn't even have a pillow, just like a sweatshirt, one blanket, one meditation cushion, a couple books, you know. So I had these tendencies, and you can see in my horoscope some tendencies. Probably in a past life, I did live as a monk. And um, my very first love of my first divine form love was Shiva, you know, just full renunciation, full yogi. I loved Shiva so much. Um, 
And I always had this top knot, you know, of my hair on the top of my head and living so simply and no jewelry and, you know, very more masculine, I would say. Um, And even though I was then partnered and obviously living in a female body and being in a relationship, a marriage relationship and so on, there was a kind of a strictness. So there were many years where it was more, I think I was more harsh. There was a strictness and a rigidity in me and a more of the renunciation bhava or vibe for me. And then, you know, my journey is that then I was pregnant. (laughs) And before being pregnant, there had been this strictness. I was so full of knowledge and so in love with the tradition, but there was more of a masculine renunciate rigidity quality there. And I very much kept my personal life away from my teaching life. I never spoke about myself. I never spoke about my personal life. I really had a very strict boundary there for good reason, because it was never about me. It was always about the students. But when I started walking into my classrooms with this growing belly, my You know, I was literally like dragging my personal life in with me, my womb, my femininity, my life as a wife, soon to be a mother. You know, this is a person who, you know, is carrying a child. And it was this, it sort of broke through that boundary and the, and it brought the divine feminine in and it shifted things. It was a bit uncomfortable for me because suddenly students were asking about what kind of birth I was going to have and who's my midwife and what, you know, it was so personal and so intimate and so raw and very unfamiliar for me, but it shattered in many ways that idea that I had to be a certain thing in order to be a teacher because that was all of my models were men or women who lived this very strict, very renunciate life, which were beautiful. I love my teachers. I gained so much from my teachers. My teachers are the divine and human form that, you know, transmitted so much so generously. So of course I wanted to be like them. And and I have those, those tendencies, that, that part of me. But yes, that juiciness for me, that the pregnancy journey and the birth journey, teaching yoga and doing one-on-one sessions, touching people's bodies while I was pregnant, and then literally teaching the Bhagavad Gita in particular while I was pregnant, you know, teaching this, mm. these teachings that are really for the householder that I had studied so many times with my teachers. Um, and it, uh, it, for me, it became completely enlivened in a different way. There's a, that was a big shift point in my life, teaching the Bhagavad Gita to a group of women while being pregnant. And then I gave birth by, I was, by the time we were in chapter two, I was giving birth (laughs) to my second child. And then, you know, I took a break. And then for the rest of the Gita, I was literally breastfeeding this baby while I was teaching the Bhagavad Gita which is described as a nectar, the Gita, you know, she is a form of the divine. She's a Devi. She's a goddess herself. And it, it really awakened this other way of being as, as a teacher for whatever unusual karma in a female body that's meant to, you know, live this particular lifestyle in life. And yet also was really, you know, as I said, kind of held by the shoulders and told, you must teach. It's not either, and was also held by the shoulders and told, you you must have children and you must be in this marriage. And so, yes, it's it's an interesting journey to be holding all of that at the same time. Why don't you tell us a little bit about you and and that, how that's manifested for you? Hmm. Hmm. I'm still marinating in you being pregnant and teaching the Bhagavad Gita. (laughs) I just started to teach Bhagavad Gita now, and I love it. I also, I was invited and blessed by Swamiji 
to share whatever I was learning from him. I was very close to him and uh, and I loved Vedic chanting and pujas. This was just like mm, the devotional uh, practices and sadhanas and I also was you know, a DC dancer and, and so on. And I came to the teacher and he kind of made sense to all of it, the yoga and being a yogi, me before and studying Ayurveda and then with the, with the teacher it all just started to make sense how everything fits together and I was blessed to enc be encouraged to always share like just share whatever you know and Buddha Swamiji also just share whatever you know you share and, and, and you study and you make other people study with you and that's actually how I look at it till this day I, I love just being in the vision and being in devotion and expressing my love for God, for goddess, for the gift of life. And, and so I really look at it as a, I love being and reveling in it and I just love to do it together. It's something that I, has been always there. I, I, I love to be taught. I love, adore being a student. Like, I so love it. <laughs> and I love to share it. I, I love it. It's, it's love. Like I also remember so well, which is Swamiji saying, the teacher-student relationship it's, it's love. It's just love expressing, like the mother expressing her love. And, and that's how I feel. And so it was also just a natural unfolding of me sharing. And I somehow felt very safe and encouraged and also free to share in terms of the Vedic tradition. And then I discovered I'm a woman. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> because <laughs> when the Vedic tradition came, it's like, I don't need women's circle. Like I remember somebody inviting me to a women's circle and I was like you, I was just like, just studying sadhu life, giving up everything. I was wearing the white salwar and bindi and my, th not threads, but the braids and had like slippers. I had like slippers for many, many, many years until now I have suddenly many shoes. I'm like, oh, wow, I have different shoes. But there was many years I just had one pair of slippers for years. <laughs> and then I go, no, I don't need anything. I only need Vedanta and the Vedic tradition. And then I was invited to a women's circle. I'm like, me, women's circle? I don't need women's circle. And then like, <laughs> why do I have such an attitude towards women's circle? I'm like, okay, I got to go there. And it was recommended by, actually by Swamiji, the woman who was leading the circle was recommended by my teacher, so whatever he recommends, I trusted. I was a little bit naive at that mm -hmm. time, but thanks God, as it was safe to be naive because uh, I had trustworthy yeah. teachers. So I went and then <laughs> my first women's circle, I just cried the whole time and realized, oh, I need this. And that's why I discovered I'm a woman and... In, in, a, in a funny way explaining this, but it is a little bit like that. And then it kind of brought me into the whole woman's sacred feminine movement and really understanding that I have a big wound when it comes to trusting women. <laughs> and so that revealed my wound with my mother and my sisters and my own self-judgments that I had towards my body. And then all of that led me to really discovering that I had a very deep sexual wounding as well. And I understood that if I don't heal this wound, I cannot fully enjoy the benefit and the result of this knowledge, the self-knowledge. Mm -hmm. and, and it just became very clear that this was becoming more part of my path. It's part of my journey um, to really dive deep into this aspect of, of my life and in this case now being a woman and being a sexual being <laughs> we are all sexual beings and and sex has not been a topic that we have discussed so often it has come up in, but it's not like a topic that we like really went into like in the tantra tradition and that is now very very popular and i'd love to invite you to another podcast and then we talk about that whole mm -hmm topic and Tantra and what is happening now in the world. I'd love to really go into that. It's not right now the, the moment, but uh, so, but yes, basically, that's why I like to call it sacred sexuality. 
because so it's not confused with tantra in terms of what neo tantra is today so sacred sexuality really that healthy relationship to our body to our desires to our sexuality owning up our sexual being and yes seeing that um, sexuality can be a means to connect to god and find profound uh, sacred union um, in that moment uh, so yeah there's so much to share about it a very beautiful topic that i love to share and also discuss with you more because i feel there's a lot to unravel and uh, an important aspect of being a human and to include that in in the spiritual tradition in a healthy way a healthy and empowering way because also yeah. in the yoga like you're a yoga teacher and i studied yoga and did yoga asana practice for so long and it for many, many years in the Iyengar tradition, Patabi Joyce, Ashtanga mm. yoga tradition, like nobody talked about really that we're sexual beings. It wasn't, it wasn't included. It was very masculine in that sense. Yes. And very, um, I think when, when I listen to both of our stories, I think about rasa, you know, I think about juiciness, juiciness of sexuality, juiciness of femininity, the juiciness of the Devi, the juiciness of pregnancy and birth and mothering and breastfeeding. And I think there are so many forms of ways of teaching Vedanta and ways of teaching asana that are rasahina, you know, without rasa. They're very dry and very... Uh, either forceful with the body or, or drying to the mind, very academic and not embodied and juicy and delicious and devotional. And I think there are a lot of challenges in a way for being to be a teacher and a steward in a traditional um, system as we are but to be doing things differently and to be a different idea of a teacher than what people have. To be in a female body, to be talking about sexuality, to be talking about motherhood, and to be teaching a tradi this tradition is very unusual and there's some very particular challenges, I think, in that. But there's this incredible opportunity for rasa, for juiciness, that is sometimes otherwise missing. I mean, Swamiji was very juicy, you know, like breaking into song and breaking into humor and jokes, but he was also very, very rare, you know, as a teacher in that way. And my other main guru also was very juicy, very humorous, very um, full, just full of rasa, full of that juiciness. But I don't think there's a lot of that... Um, I don't think it's common, and I think it's this rare challenge but opportunity to be in a female body where you're embodying juiciness, <laughs> and then to be able to share in a juicy way, which yes. is special. Very special. <laughs> so special. It was such a journey for me to, to do what I do today like yeah it was a few years like i studied i started to heal my sexual traumas more than 10 12 years ago but or even 14 years ago but it took me 10 years just of my own sexual healing before i dared yeah. to like go out and share and teach about it and and the main reason i feel at least is like i was a afraid I would hurt my tradition I would go against my tradition yeah. I would I'm doing something wrong and I knew like I knew in my bones that I'm not because but it was interesting that I still felt it like n none of my teachers would ever give the indication that this goes in any way against but it was something in me that I really had to uh, neutralize and maybe there I picked up some things. Of course, we never know what we pick up from. In, in, There's so many things coming at us <laughs> and we pick up. And, but then also our own uh, judgments and, and projections we have. And now 
like this phase, these last four or five years, really coming out as not only a Vedic wisdom teacher, but also a sacred sexuality teacher and combining that, it, it was really a, a birthing process for me and, and owning that, that part and, and loving that part so much. Like it's, it's as much as I love being in the Veda and in the Vedanta where it's just being in the vision and in stillness and in silence or in words, but also to like embody this woman, this fire and, and that sexual part is just that Shiva Shakti. Oh, it's so phenomenal. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. And especially and, me. And it's vulnerable. Her. It's very vulnerable. Yeah. What, what you're very describing, vulnerable. it's messy and it's vulnerable. And I think about it, I have this image of like cracking an egg. And when um, you first learn to do that, if you ever learn to crack an egg, you know, it's, it's, it's really messy. The, the shell shatters and the yolk gets everywhere. And it's like, it's juicy, but it's really, really messy. And it's a... You have to develop that that skill of mm, kind of holding all of that and containing it uh, in a way that's very um, useful. I think maybe this is true for me. I think maybe it's true for you too, where you sort of reach a point where you can't compartmentalize. You know, you can't divide the tradition and the Vedanta and the teachings and your life and who you really are, and the more you accept who you are, who you're designed to be fully in this life, then you, I think maybe the more so at being in a female body, you know, like the Devi with all of the arms, you, you, you have to be able to do all of it at the same time, and you can't compartmentalize. And I think as a sadhu or a renunciate or a person who lives a renunciation life, they don't have to compartmentalize because it's all that their life is. And a householder, teacher, with worldly responsibilities, I think we have to choose to either compartmentalize our lives. Okay, here I'm teaching and here I'm being in my life and being who I really am, you know. But then the teaching suffers and the life suffers. And I think particularly women, we're not designed to compartmentalize. We're designed to have all of these arms, you know, doing all of these things at the same time, breastfeeding and teaching Vedanta or, you know, talking about sacred sexuality and, you know, Vedanta within the same, you know, within the same talk or within the same exchange. There's a, there's a magic in that, but I think it's very vulnerable to... Um, get to that place. It's inwardly vulnerable because we don't have a lot of models for it. And it's also outwardly vulnerable because people can make assumptions um, or you can become a target for something in some way. I was thinking, who do we have as a model for being in a female body and being a householder and being fire and being a teacher? And I thought of Draupadi, you know, the, mm. the, the wife of the five, the Pandavas in the Mahabharata, because she's born of fire and she's considered, you know, she's very black skinned and she's considered the most beautiful woman of her time and very, very wise. And she's married to five husbands. You know, they all take turns. <laughs> Who gets to share her bed <laughs> for periods of time and rules around that. And she has to take on this crazy karma of being married to five warriors but she's very wise and there's so many points where she is the teacher and they're listening and she's advising and teaching you know her husbands she was the only one who didn't want the the war to be avoided right mm. she's born a fire <laughs> let's fight <laughs> 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 yeah, so I, you know, I think okay, well this this is part of th this is this is okay to be to be doing what we're doing even if we don't have a lot of modern uh models for it and we're sort of sometimes messily I feel figuring it out. I feel sometimes, you know, I have to navigate students you know, projecting things onto me because they see me as mother or, you know, I'm sure it happens with you projecting things onto you as you're bringing up sexuality and all of these things and showing up in a particular way, but we have to figure out how to do it anyway, because I think uh, there's no other way. 
<laughs> it's like I couldn't walk in to, when I was pregnant. I couldn't show up for my classes and take the belly off. <laughs> You can't remove the yoni before you go and teach Vedanta. You know, it's like, it's all, it's there anyway. So what choice do we have but embrace who we are, even if it's messy or strange or unexpected or unusual. And then hopefully, you know, the students that we work with, that we're blessed to be in relationship with also can see you have no choice but to be who you are. <laughs> you better, you might as well get to it. <laughs> And embrace it fully and love it unconditionally. Like, and that is Vedanta, right? self-knowledge. Yeah, it's freedom, exactly. is to love yourself exactly. unconditionally. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, I feel this is a wonderful, a wonderful moment to love ourselves unconditionally here and now with all the messiness, <laughs> complete utter messiness. And, and love each other. And how much freedom is that? You know, there's so much freedom in that, loving ourselves and each other as we are, the way we are, as long as we are. <laughs> exactly. Mm. Ah, thank you so much, Kaya. Is there anything else you want to say before we close this session no i feel happy i feel full of satisfaction <laughs> you me too i feel so blessed to be able to share in this way and i look forward to the second episode <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much everyone who has been tuning in and listening and so if you want to study with Kaya Devi uh, go and check out her website Kaya yogawithkaya.com and we're also going to post the link and we're going to post all the information so you can follow Kaya on social media and join her incredible beautiful um, Shri Yoga Studio the supreme release, Re release yoga. Is that correct? The Shri Studio. Yeah. Shri is actually a is a title for wealth and Devi, the wealth of wealth. And then I love that how you took the ac acronym. Acronym, you say, like when you have the letters. Yeah, I think that's the word. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like S for um, supreme, like the highest, and then R for release. And then the why for yoga, the supreme release yoga. <gasps> oh, is there anything better? And you can join her stories yeah. and the Jyotisha <laughs> and, and just follow her and be with her in incredible wealth of knowledge and with so much experience and being a mother and having children. So she knows what she talks about. <laughs> and I also pray that she will join us for Navaratri our nine nights of the goddess festival we're still discussing and seeing that we're gonna host this year live in person not only online but also in person in portugal i'm so excited for that yeah. it's going to be an incredible rite of passage into dharmic leadership with the spark of eros so mm. Mm. <laughs> so thank you everyone <laughs> i wish you moksha freedom you are born to be free. Follow your heart. And if you like this episode, please um, let, leave us a review. It would mean us so much. And if you want to share this episode with your friends and family, please go ahead and share it if you feel that they can um, illuminate the hearts of seekers and who are sincerely looking for, for answers to the fundamental questions of life. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kaya. I love you as you are. Thank You're so you. Good. Thank you. So Thank you, Shout of the Devi. I love you too. You're a big inspiration, big beauty. <laughs> oh. From my heart to your deepest gratitude for your presence, may you follow your wildest dreams, live your highest purpose, and expand into the infinite, because that's what you are. <laughs>